so we don't see that long QT syndrome or corrected QT. What do you look for? Like what number? Do you use a number that you kind of look for in a patient for like either the corrected QT or the QT? Well, I look at the that? corrected QT, see, okay. which is uh, normally uh, um, there is a normal range which is different for women than in men. Mm -hmm. It's in the 440, 460 range. Okay. But most of the time you're not going to have a problem unless it gets to be above 500. And our corrected QT above 500 is where we really start to worry that that would be the cause. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Good to know. So you have this Brugada syndrome here, uh, well, pattern with the clinical uh, manifestations. And this is very typical of Brugada syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant congenital uh, sodium channel lopathy, a channel lopathy right. of the myocardium. And that's what the underlying pathology is here and there's a treatment which we're going to talk about in a little bit. All right, well let's take a look at what happened when they uh, called the cardiologist then. All right, sounds good. EKG shows ST segment elevation in V1, 2, and 3. I'm thinking Brugada syndrome. Hmm. What? Dr. Gates will be back to discuss all of my recommendations. Please, can I go in with Tracy? Yeah, as soon as I get back. It's not Brugada. Ventricular arrhythmia in an Asian man? Classic EKG findings? That's not ST elevation. It's early repolarization. How do you explain the VTAC? Gee, maybe it has something to do with the amphetamines in his urine. Well, he took a pill three days ago, but nothing since then. And every drunk with an ETOH of 500 only had two beers. Repeat his cardiac enzymes. If they're negative, I'll clear him for discharge. Or jail for DUI. He had a cardiac arrest. From the amphetamine. And you don't think it can happen again? Not unless he takes more drugs. Well, I disagree with you. If it's Brugada, it could happen any time. I think he needs an implantable defibrillator. Well, let's continue this discussion after you complete a cardiology fellowship. All right. <laughs> that's not a conversation that we're, any of us are going to look forward to. Um, the cardiologist, though, did mention that he thought he was interpreting that ECG as early repolarization, or he used the term, I think, benign early repolarization. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? And I, I brought this, I put this ECG up to kind of let you look through that and, and tell us what benign or early repolarization is. Okay, well, uh, thank you. It's, I'll, I'll review this ECG in a, in a second here, but. Um, Again, this situation arises when we're dealing with someone who has, for example, chest pain, a potential acute coronary syndrome, or a cardiac-related issue. If there's ST segment elevation, is that an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or not? And there's a differential diagnosis to this, as right. I alluded to already with Brugada syndrome being one possible cause of ST segment elevation. The other common setting is benign early repolarization, because you see ST segment elevation most commonly in the precordial leads. And in lead V2, it's up to maybe three uh, millimeters, three small three boxes, small three boxes. millimeters. There's a little bit here in uh, V1, there's a little bit here in V3, and less so here in V5. It extends a little bit all the way out through V6. And in fact, you see it here in the inferior leads. So how can you differentiate this ST segment elevation of benign early repolarization versus more ominous causes of ST segment elevation? So there's two things to look at. First of all, you look at as the concavity of the ST segment. And you look at it this way. It is sort of concave up. And uh, an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction is often straight or convex. It's not concave with this smooth upright into a fairly large T wave. So that's one way of differentiating it. Another way of differentiating it is you see this notching in the J point. Right. Just yeah. as the ST segment meets the QRS column, you see some notching. Mm -hmm. That is characteristic of benign early repolarization. You do not see that in ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And finally, and most importantly, the last point, right. there is no reciprocal changes. Reciprocal ST segment changes are a key way to differentiate the ST segment elevation 
of myocardial infarction from the other causes of ST segment elevation, such as benign early repolarization. Others include left ventricular hypertrophy, pericarditis, uh, left ventricular aneurysm. So again, so because of that, this is characteristic of benign early repolarization. So in that, so you're saying that looking at those reciprocal changes, if we see those reciprocal changes, that strongly suggests acute myocardial infarction. If we yes. don't see them, we haven't ruled out acute myocardial infarction, though. Is that correct? That's correct. Because okay. that you need, you know, serial ECGs, cardiac markers. That's another uh, topic in itself. Okay, so um, if we look at this ECG and remember the other ECG, we were looking at V1, V2, and V3. Mm -hmm. In the other ECG with the Brugada, there was almost an incomplete uh, right bundle branch block pattern in V1, V2, right. V3. The ST segment was coving down, and there was a ST segment that was elevated, but it looked kind of like this. It was quite a bit elevated off the bed, off the baseline. It doesn't look like the ST segment here. This is a very distinct pattern from the previous one we looked to, and this is what benign early repolarization looks like. You have the associated changes in the inferior lead with the notching, and you don't have that in the other ECG, right. where the ECG changes are only confined to V1, V2, V3 in a classic pattern. Okay, so it's definitely something that we should pay attention to, but as this cardiologist may have gotten a little jump to in that case was that, um, because when you see a young patient with ST segment elevation, I think a lot of us do think about early repolarization or benign early repolarization. But sometimes it's hard to figure out like exactly if that's an ST segment elevation MI early or is that early repolarization pattern. So, you know, falling back on the history like you mentioned, it sounds like it's important. And then really understanding how to differentiate those things on ECG. And then getting another ECG is what uh, right serial you've ECGs, told me. Yeah. yeah, chest pain, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, markers, etc. That can really help. All right, let's uh, go and check on that all that happy. Doctor Gates, mm. can I talk to you for a minute? Yep. I understand that Doctor Kaysen wrote a discharge order for Bevan Guan, mm -hmm. and that you canceled it. Is this your idea of creative problem solving? What else to do? Well, did you consider a Holter monitor? What about a transfer? Russell VTech, I need a doctor in here. Open the crash cart. Call Kate. Well, all right. It sounds like uh, that the resident actually took your advice and um, ended up keeping the patient in the emergency department and continuing the patient on the monitor despite their consultant's recommendations. So, you know, maybe wasn't the best solution as far as not discussing it a little further with the cardiologist or, or bumping it up to that resident's attending level in the emergency department, but definitely did the right thing by the patient, it sounds like. And then obviously it sounds like they needed an emergency uh, intervention yeah. here. <laughs> and so let's see what happened. Going again, clear. Normal sinus. Strong carotid. What happened? Pulses VTAC. You're kidding. Oh. Take a look at the strip. 150 amiodarone. Recurrent ventricular arrhythmias in the absence of amphetamines. It's possible he'll need an implantable defibrillator. Glad I didn't discharge him. He would have died on the way home. Yeah, good thing we got busy with another trauma. I'll go prep the EPS lab. You all right, Dr. Gates? Hey, Jack, hold on. Uh, Welcome back. You know, sometimes I wish I could just see the patients by myself without the residents. Huh. Life would be so much easier. I know. They don't listen. They don't want to learn. Well, they think they know everything. Mm. You know the worst part? Mm. Every now and then, they turn out to be right. And so in this patient, it was, I think, fairly obvious he needed a defibrillator, you know, an imprint, an AICD, we call them. But what about in the patient when you, you get the patient that came in and ha he has syncope or she has syncope, um, you get the ECG and it you know, concerns you for Brigada, but there's no history of v ventricular tachycardia or anything that you really have to make it obvious what's going on. What do you do with a patient who's got some Brigada findings on ECG and a history of syncope, but no ventricular tachycardia? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So first of all, I want to point out, Brigada syndrome is pretty rare. I mean, it's not, you know, okay. not that common. But when you see it, you have to re recognize that pattern. It's sort of pattern recognition. 
So we have a Brugada pattern, and the patient, in order to meet the criteria for a, a syndrome, has to have a syncopal episode or a, a witness or unwitnessed cardiac arrest, or if he had a heart monitor on, uh, he's like a Holter monitor, ambulatory, okay. then he would have evidence of VTAC. That's what distinguishes the syndrome. Okay. But sometimes you just see the pattern. And actually, uh, there are three patterns to recognize. This ECG is the type 1 pattern, which is the one that really leads to ventricular tachycardia. The other pattern is a little less so. Okay. So it, what do you do then if you have asymptomatic and you just have an incidental ECG, as right. you pointed out? So that patient is, well, why are they having the pattern? Mm -hmm. And the first thing to recognize is that this is a sodium channel lopathy. So one of the issues is drugs can induce the pattern. Okay. So, and uh, the most common sodium channel blocker known is cocaine. This patient had taken oh. some amphetamines, but cocaine can bring out the pattern because it's a sodium channel blocker. Certain tricyclic antidepressants and certain other neuroleptic drugs can also bring out the pattern. But that doesn't make it a Brugada syndrome. That's right. just uh, the, the ECG. Pa EG pattern, okay. and the pattern will go away once the drugs or the offending oh. medication is okay. stopped. So that's an example where you might see the pattern, but not the syndrome. So what cardiologists might do is they may take them to the EP lab and okay. give them a sodium channel blocker, most commonly is either flecainide or procainamide, which would then induce the pattern or even induce ventricular tachycardia to diagnose the syndrome. Okay. But if you've already had a, an episode of cardiac arrest or, or proven ventricular tachycardia or a good history to suggest cardiac syncope, you don't have to do the testing. You just make the assumption. Right. So that's the difference between the pattern and, and the, the syndrome. syndrome. And the pattern does not automatically mean the syndrome. It could be drug-related or incidental, whatever is going on. So if you see a patient who comes in with syncope and then you see this pattern on ECG, you're, you're getting a cardiology consult, you're admitting that patient. That patient should be admitted. And okay. in fact, you shouldn't take no from the consultant because if he's coming in with syncope and a good story of syncope uh, with uh, that pattern, uh -huh. that is Brugada syndrome and recurrent ventricular tachycardia until proven otherwise. And the only way to manage that is to admit the patient. Right. So this is somebody with syncope without symptoms currently, but with the pattern right. on ECG. Okay. Yeah. What about the patient who has no symptoms, is in there for some other reason, and then comes in not like no syncope, no, nothing that really sounds cardiac, and comes in and you get the ECG, which looks abnormal. In that patient, do you admit that patient as well? or? No, that patient doesn't have to be admitted. Uh, again, further history. Is there a family history? Uh -huh. Has he had episodes of syncope in the past? Uh, any abnormalities on cardiac exam? And in particular, his uh, med drug and medication history. And if he's on medications that could induce the Brugada syndrome, uh -huh. and you can do a quick, again, online search, uh, Brugada syndrome plus medications or plus drugs, and you'll get a list, you can run through that. And if the, pattern, if the patient just has the pattern but no symptoms and this was truly an incidental finding, I would refer that patient to a cardiologist, specifically an arrhythmia person, who can then do uh, further investigations, which may mean bringing him to the lab to in, see if he has inducible VTAC and, uh, uh, with uh, a Brugada syndrome. That's one thing to do. What you could okay. also do if you're really concerned is to put the patient on a Holter monitor, okay. discharge the patient pending that cardiology evaluation to see if he's having any non-sustained ventricular tachycardia that may be asymptomatic. Remember, young people can tolerate a few runs of short ventricular tachycardia, maybe with no symptoms whatsoever, be completely asymptomatic. Okay. So I might do that. So, so it sounds like it is going to come back to history again. So if the patient has the obviously concerning ventricular tachycardia, syncope history, that patient's going to cardiology, probably going to get, he or she is probably going to get treated with an AICD. If the patient has syncope or a cardiac kind of concerning story or a family history, as you pointed out again, uh, with that Brugada pattern, we're going to admit them cardiology consult. If there's no cardiac sounding symptoms, no family history of syncope, the Brugada pattern, 
You're going to check for the meds or drugs that could put that, get that pattern, cause that pattern to be there. You're going to do an outpatient cards consult, make sure that person has follow-up, and then you're going to consider some monitoring as an outpatient as well. But you're not going to mandatorily or always admit that patient to right. cardiology. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, that is um, excellent and very helpful, and it sounds like we did the right thing for this patient, and we have a good idea of how to manage some complex patterns on ECG and how to interpret them. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank you. That's a very interesting case. Yes.